Amen. I thank God for freedom. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It means different things to different people. Amen. Amen. You know, I uh, can't always make all the decisions I want to make. I really can't plan my life the way I want it to go. But man, I'll tell you what, I have freedom in my soul. Amen. God. <laughs> Let God lead your life, folks. Let God lead your life. Amen. And if you're stubborn, you know, I'm kind of stubborn. I'm kind of self-willed in a way. I have been. I seem to be getting over it more and more as time goes by. Amen. You know, there's something about kind of like losing control of your life, you know, and, uh, and, and, and finding freedom in that. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I love the Lord. I thank him. I thank him for his blessings. I thank him. You know, God has taken, this is an old expression. We got to be a little bit politically correct, I suppose. Take me to the woodshed. <laughs> Anybody ever been taken to the woodshed? Amen. Amen. Well, we didn't have a woodshed, but my dad would take me in the, in the other room, you know, and let me have it when I was a kid. And I'm sure I had it coming sometimes. I think there was a few times I actually didn't have it coming, but you know. <laughs> but there was a few times I should have got it, and I didn't get it too, though. So, you know, God has taken me to the woodshed a few times, folks. You know, it is my prayer. It is my sincere prayer, God. God, take me to the woodshed. I want to be your child. Take me to the woodshed when I need to go. Amen. Mark chapter 13, verses 33 through 34. It says, Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. Oh, we don't know where we're at in the time frame of our life, folks. We really don't. We may think we do. It's good to plan, but it is like a man going on a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants each and to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. The King James Version, that's from the New King James Version. The New King James Version, or the King James Version actually uses a better word there, I think. It says he commanded the porter to watch. Amen. Let's pray a minute. Father God, thank you, Lord, for, for that porter, oh God, in my life. Amen. It's an old-fashioned word, you know. It's kind of a, I, I kind of picture it as being a, a combination of a, of a greeter at the store and a guard. And, you know, the, the, there's this wall around the city. There's this courtyard around the stronghold. And there has to be ways to get in and out of it. When, you know, we think about a wall around the city, I like to think about Nehemiah, the rebuilding of the wall. The rubble was 142 years. There, there, there was rubble around that city for 142 years. They had lived several lives in that rubble. I imagine the children played in it. I imagine there were wild animals that were nesting in it. I imagine there were snakes in it, all kinds of stuff. You know, it was just there. It was part of the landscape. It was part of their life. It was there for 142 years years they were used to it and one day some guy comes inspired by God and they rebuilt the wall it only took them I think 52 days they rebuilt this wall out of this old stone that had laid around for a hundred I am fascinated by that thought I mean I, I've preached about it quite a few times over the years I am just fascinated to think and think about our lives is there some rubble in your life is there some stuff in your life that's just been around for so long? <laughs> God wants to take that very rubble and make it into something good. Amen. In your life. Amen. Amen. Getting back to Nehemiah chapter 7 and verse 3, they got this wall done. And when they got the wall done, then they set some things in order to make the wall useful. We need a wall around our life. We need there to be openings and closings. My kids, you know, it drives me crazy nowadays. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. When I was, you beautiful young people, you know, it's hard to believe it was only 45 years ago I was one of you, you know. <laughs> the telephone was this big square thing that hung on the wall in our kitchen. And I think, you know, I don't think we even had an extension in our house. I mean, the phone would ring, 
my mother, my dear mother, would answer that phone, and she knew who I was talking to. <laughs> I see my kids, and they are diddling around on that phone. I have no idea who they're talking to. You know, Brother Betcher, I like the old way better. No, oh, Brother Steve being an old guy. You know, in, you know, if I can just digress a little, when I was in my teens, late teens, girls didn't call guys. It just wasn't done. I know uh, the dear lady who I ended up marrying called me one time shortly after I met her. <laughs> she wanted me to come over, do something. I'd been home, and she called. I think, she, I think it's probably the only time she ever did it, too. And she called, and my mother says, there's some girl on the phone for you. <laughs> oh, this wall around the city. Nehemiah 7.3. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'm about ready to go home and throw all them stupid phones away. I really am. Amen. And I said to them, do not let the gates of Jerusalem be open till the sun is hot. And while they stand guard, let them shut and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Each one at his watch station, another in front of his own house. So we had gatekeepers. Yeah, we got ta pastors. We got teachers. We got parents. Okay, first of all, we got a gatekeeper. We got a porter. Number two, the timing. We do not open the gates unless it is broad daylight. We can really see what's going on. We are not going to make ourselves vulnerable. Think about the doors that are in your life. Do not make yourself vulnerable. If you're weak, leave the laptop you know, locked up in your office at work. Don't take it home with you if you're, if you're weak. Seriously. Don't take it in your bedroom. Praise God. Let's not open the door unless the sun is up. Amen. When you sit at the table, turn the computer to where everybody in the house can see it. All right? Amen. Singers. They appointed singers. They had professional singers to worship God around this gate. And they had the Levites around this gate. They put all these things in motion around this gate because the gate was, the, the wall, I'm sorry, the wall was not going to work unless they had worship, unless they had praise, unless they had the moving of God's spirit, the word of God, the church, all these things we need because we need to have a wall around our lives, but we need to have doorways. We need to let things in. We need to let things out. But we have got to allow those things to be controlled by the Spirit of God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, I do remember those. I am actually old enough to. I'm 49. I can't hide it. It's what it is. And I remember so that I could talk on the phone, my dad actually went and got an extension so I can go just kind of sit on the floor instead of standing up next to the phone for, you know, for whatever. Anyways. Walls. Yeah, I was holding them up half the time. <laughs> Tonight, I think we're going to have a little bit of fun, but I also want us to listen, not just with the ears, but with our hearts. This thought came to me as I was reading through Matthew and kind of solidified coming into the weekend. So I'm not quite sure how we're going to go and where we're going to go completely with it, but I think we'll have some fun with it. And uh, just a quick announcement. Uh, Brother Paulus, thank you for praying with me today uh, my manager's daughter uh, tried to commit suicide and brother Paulus happened to be out by me in the warehouse when he came by and we had prayer with him and his daughter is in the hospital she appears to be doing okay so and I know a couple other my brothers prayed with me on this so thank you for that but my end game with this is to win Brian and his family that's my end game on this one. So again, thanks to the, the guys who were praying and Brother Paulus, who it's not by accident that you happen to be out there. 
So in today's time in vernacular, when people are doing well and prospering and, you know, they're moving up the corporate ladder or they're maybe moving out of their neighborhood because they have the means and the, and the opportunity to do so and maybe you've been there a while and, and people begin to murmur about that and they, they begin to maybe half-heartedly, some people maybe with an undertone, kind of despise what you're doing. They don't like the fact that you may be doing better than they do. And it could be because you put the time and the effort into it, and God is blessing that effort. It could be that because you went to college, you got that job, whereas the guy that didn't go to college, he's not qualified to get the job. Not that God can't do something for that individual because it has happened. Trust me. But all sorts of negativity and even jokingly, half-heartedly. and People, somebody will, you know, you begin to think about it and you just, the phrase that comes to mind in today's vernacular, haters are going to hate. See, you all said it. I know it. Haters are going to hate. And there's no way around it. It doesn't matter where we're at in station in life, whether in the natural or in the spiritual. Haters are going to hate. It doesn't matter. We find in the book of Acts, chapter 5, that the apostles are all preaching and teaching in the synagogue and and. The chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees aren't really liking this too much. Miracles, signs, and wonders are being done, and these guys are just, just preaching the daylights out of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And they didn't like that, and they said, hey, go get those guys. We can't have this in our temple. And they rounded them up, and they threw them in the jail. Walls. And an angel pays a little visit to him. And he opens the doors and lets them out. And the Sanhedrin and the council and the elders, they, say, they tell the guards, the, the, the people in charge, hey, go bring those guys before us. We need to talk to them some more. They get out there and they're like, hey, they're not here. Where'd they go? They go back and tell the council, hey, they're not there. Some guy comes in, oh, but they're right back out there where they were before. They're out there preaching Jesus Christ again. But you know what? Despite their jealousy and their envy, haters are going to hate. But they kept doing what Jesus Christ had commanded them to do. Haters are going to hate. Can you imagine that? We're having a church meeting and they throw us in jail and then all of a sudden, Midnight comes around after we've been praising and worshiping, and hey, go bring those guys before us again. Oh my goodness, they're back in church. They're preaching and teaching Jesus Christ again. <laughs> Haters going to hate. I had a, a friend of mine years back. His name was Eric, and <clears throat> He grew up in Cabrini Green, and his life was heading downward, but he had a teacher that was interested enough in his life and could see that this kid could go somewhere if somebody invests some time in him. And so that teacher did in uh, sophomore, junior, and senior year. His grades picked up, and he started doing really, really well. He went to the University of Minnesota, got a degree in business and something else. Comes back home, decides, yeah, I'm, I'm moving out to the suburbs. I can't imagine why. And mind you, this is an African-American gentleman, by the way. For some of you too young to know what Cabrini Green is. That was a housing project down in the city of Chicago. Horrible, horrible area. 
And he would go back to visit his friends periodically. And they would say, hey, Eric, when are you moving back? Why are you moving out way out to, at that time he was living in Des Plaines. Why are you moving out to Des Plaines? And he's like, are you kidding me? Why would I want to live there when I can live here? Why would I want to be getting shot at or hearing shots ring out or be afraid to even go to my car? Why would I want to do that? And you know what they called him? They called him an Uncle Tom. And other names that I won't use. Haters are going to hate. They couldn't stand the fact that Somebody invested some time, picked himself up by his bootstraps, went and got a degree, got a good job, and moved out of the ghetto. Haters are going to hate. And it's no different for any of us if when we move up in life, especially in the spiritual life, you are going to find that there are going to be haters that are going to hate. When people begin to realize that they can move up and out because they have the means to do so. When somebody repents of their sins and are baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, they get to move out of addiction. They get to move out of abuse. They get to move out of immorality and affliction. They get to move out of sin. They're moving on up. Back to Jesus, he's referring in Matthew where I was reading to the Pharisees. The Pharisees, these guys were nasty. When you read about them, these were not these nice gentlemen who were all pious and all, you know, godly. And Man, this guy comes on the scene, and he starts preaching and teaching and healing people, and the people start following him. Man, they're like, whoa, we got a problem. Church attendance is down because this guy's in town. We got to do something to get rid of him. They were moved with envy and jealousy and an indignation that turned into anger and a rage to try to end his life. But you know what? Haters are going to hate. He goes into a town and does a good work for the kingdom of God, and they didn't like it. But you know what? Haters are going to hate. But it didn't matter to the people that were affected by the power of the Most High because they were set free. They were delivered. They didn't care what anybody else had to say. They were free, and they moved on out. Now I'm going to get a little real. You see a yank, it's because I got too real. But mind you, I'm lumping myself in this as well. Sometimes we see our brothers and our sisters prospering. Sometimes we see them going from here to here. And we see them surpassing our own walk. And we see them being used of God. And deep down inside, because we didn't measure up, we can't stand it. I told you it was going to get real. We don't know what our heart is like. But it manifests itself in many, many ways. And it's just like the scribes and the Pharisees. But when we see somebody be restored, when we see somebody begin to hunger and thirst after righteousness, our first inclination ought to be, brother, that, sister, that is awesome. I want to see you grow. Instead of having that in my heart, being envious. But know this, that if you're growing And surpassing other people, haters are going to hate. It doesn't matter, natural or in the spiritual world. Haters are going to hate. The principles are the same. We see other churches or ministers being mightily used and we get upset. But instead of turning inwards 
and letting the Holy Ghost search us. We react to what we see, especially if we think we know all about that individual. He or she was a drug addict, they were an alcoholic, they were immoral, whatever the case may be. Whatever sin you can think of, that's, oh, I, yeah, there's, yeah, no, no, mm -mm. there's no way, no way that Jesus is going to be really using them. Mm -mm. Careful is right. Oh, yes, he is. That's just the individual that he is looking for. Because he or she has been changed. They've been touched by the power of the Most High. So why all the hate? Why all the hate? We see it every day. We hear it on the news. We see it in the papers. We see it on the Drudge Report. We see it this, there, and everywhere else. We see it in the workplace. We see it in the schools. We see it on the street. We see it in the shopping malls. We see it everywhere we go, some measure of hate taking place there. Why? When the adversary sees hundreds and thousands of peoples being affected by Jesus and all of those miracle signs and wonders taking place, he's losing capital. Basically, he's losing money, in effect, to put it in a natural sense. How many of you ever saw in the movie It's a Wonderful Life? Yeah. That is one of my all-time favorite movies. I love that movie. But you remember that scene where George is in a pickle. And Mr. P he goes to see Mr. Potter. Mr. Potter is the worst man in town. And he goes to see Mr. Potter. And Mr. Potter begins to offer him the moon if he would just sell the Bailey building and loan. Now that Building and loan had been responsible for a lot of people getting out of Potter's little shanties and slum area. And more and more people were getting out of those areas. He was losing his rent and his, and his mortgages. And so, George, I'll give you this, this, that, and the other thing. Fortunately, George came to himself. But that's what takes place? You just kind of, I got something for you. If you'll just slow it down a little bit, there is no need to get so excited about Jesus and him crucified. There's no need to get excited about somebody being delivered. There's no reason, you know, to get excited about somebody up there preaching the gospel. And you get an opportunity. He, he was a hater. He was trying to beat George at his own game. And he could not do it. The adversary is no different. When people start moving off of Heartbreak Hill and begin to leave Sinville, if you will, he doesn't take kindly to it. When you move on up, as the Jefferson song said, moving on up to the east side, he doesn't like that because you were down here and now you're up on the 55th floor or whatever it is, living high on the hog because you decided to do something with your life. The world and its system hate us because we have been translated from darkness to light by the power of his son Colossians 1 13 
who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us unto the kingdom of his dear son. This means that someone has been delivered and is no longer a servant of sin. That means they've moved on up. And that means that wherever they went from, there's a lot of people that were left back there hating what they did because now they don't run with them anymore. They don't run to the same excesses and do the same things that they used to do. They're not down there on the, in the crack pit, and they're not down there at the bar getting drunk with them. They've been delivered. They've come out of that life. They've been translated. But haters are going to hate. you we have some fun but I hope you're hearing what I'm saying I hope you're understanding what is taking place many of us have experienced that probably even this week as we've gone about our everyday life and everyday routines Maybe it wasn't so overt, but definitely undertones. I've already seen it at work. It's already happened to me a couple times this week, and it's only Wednesday. But I see for what it is, and I'm not going to let it. I'm not going to let it do anything to me. And so when the people make that move to repent and are baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, the devil doesn't have a hold on us any longer. That legal, that legal hold he had is gone. We've been redeemed. We've been bought with a price. When we move upward in the kingdom, oh, the hating gets worse. Especially if you've decided that you want to know him instead of knowing about him. There's a price to be paid when we want to go to that depth. There really is. There's a heavy price that has to be paid for that. But many people just desire to know about him. There's no real commitment, no real relationship. It's kind of typified in the world around us. I don't want to get married, I just want to shack up. I'm, you know, I'm lazy, they don't like the work, they don't want to do this, they don't want to do that, you know. It, it's typical, typical of, the, of the world around us. There's a lot of parallels between the two. Little involvement. There are some people that don't like, as I mentioned, others prospering spiritually. They can't understand the relationship and the magnificence of his power and his presence. When we make that step, when we start going further, people aren't going to understand. They're going to see God using people in a tremendously mighty way. And they're always going to hearken back to, as I mentioned before, this, that, and the other thing. But you're going deeper. You're wanting to know him more. You're wanting to be transformed in his presence and by his word. Elijah, after Mount Carmel, there was a certain queen who was not real happy about what happened. And she said, I, I, we got to kill this guy. We need to get Elijah. We need to take him out. And Elijah became fearful, and he fled. Even though he had just done the work of God, haters are going to hate, and she was hating pretty mightily. But God delivered him, and God took care of him. Cain and Abel, 
Abel offered a better and proper sacrifice. But we find in Scripture that Cain was angry because his sacrifice wasn't accepted because he didn't listen to his dad and do the proper sacrifice. And God even actually warned him and said, Hey, you're angry. You got an opportunity here. Don't do it. And he did it anyways. Haters are going to hate. In this case, it cost his, Abel his life. Our prime example, Jesus. Sanhedrin, they saw all these miracles being done. I mean, this guy was a miracle machine. God in the flesh just tearing it up. Miracles that they had never seen before. Never seen before. And all these people are coming out to him. That's why they hated John the Baptist. They talked about the multitudes coming out to him. Our church attendance is down to three. I got no money coming in. But they were taking all these people away. Why? Because of the authority and power that he exhibited. They knew that there was a difference between what Jesus was saying, what John the Baptist was saying, and the power and the anointing that was upon them, as opposed to what the rabbi was saying as he got up every Sabbath day and said, Thus saith the Lord. Hold that scroll a little closer for me. People's lives were being radically altered in the presence of Jesus Christ. And that happens anytime when we come into his presence, even today. As we came into his presence today, there were opportunities to be radically altered and changed as we were lifting up our hands and worship to him. But they couldn't keep people from an encounter with God. If you really want something, nothing is going to stop you from getting it. If you want a closer walk with Jesus, nothing is going to stop you. Nobody is going to be able to hold you back. They may try to grab onto your shirt, but you're going to keep going even if it rips off because you want to get closer to Jesus Christ. They may hate a while. They may stew in it a while, but you're going to be closer and you're going to know him in a more intimate way than you've ever known him before. They didn't like all of his I am statements. They really were not happy with that. Well, who do you think you are, God? Well, in a matter of speaking, yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah. Is there a problem with that? Well, yeah, there was. They didn't see it. They didn't catch it. They didn't grasp what was being done before their very eyes. Oh, he's making himself God again. He's saying those I am statements again. What are we going to do with him? He's making these statements, declaring himself as God. He's doing miracles, signs, and wonders, and the people are following after him. What are we going to do? Haters are going to hate. Jesus talks about something interesting in Matthew 21, 46, when he was going through a little bit of a conversation with people. That was the wrong verse. Sorry. But I know what I wanted to say. He told them that the kingdom would be taken away from them and given to another. He just got tired of it and said, you know what? I've had enough of you guys. I came here to try to, to, to show you who I am so that there could be a new beginning for all of you people to put you back in right relationship with me. But you know what? You don't want to listen. I'm going to go to another 
nation. I'm going to go to another people because you don't want to hear it. Haters are going to hate. And he said, enough with this. As a matter of fact, we find Paul saying the same thing later in the book of Acts. Okay, you guys don't want to listen? I'm going to the Gentiles, and that's who Jesus was referring to. I'm just going to go to the Gentiles. I'm done with you people. You don't want to listen. You don't want to hear. You're stiff-necked and hard-hearted. You can hate all you want to, but I'm going to these people because you know what? They don't even have a clue about Judaism or a one God, and I'm going to do mighty miracles and acts in front of them, and they are going to believe, and they will be converted, and they will be drawn unto me. So you know what? I'm going to just bypass the kingdom that I really wanted. And they were openly upset that salvation would be given to another. They thought they were all that. They thought that they were going to be the ones and they weren't going to share with anybody else. Despite what the prophets had said and so forth, that the Gentiles, us, would be able to come into his kingdom. But haters are going to hate. Paul. This dude was one smart Pharisee. He knew the law inside and out. But God had other plans. Paul could have easily have said, you know what? I know I got knocked off my horse, and I know that there's a really bright light, and I know that I'm blinded, but I'm not buying this that you're Jesus there, God. Mm, Not buying that. This was a man who was holding the coats of them that stoned Stephen. This was a guy who was on the road to Damascus with letters to bring the people into prison. But Jesus says something interesting. He not only wanted to use Paul to be that vessel to the Gentiles, but he also wanted him to know and through him to show him what things that he's going to have to suffer for my name's sake. All that stuff you were doing, guess what, fella? Now you're going to see what it's like to be hated. Now you're going to see what it's like to be despised. Now you're going to see what it's like to be the off-scouring of the earth. But you know what? That didn't bother Paul. It didn't bother him at all. He knew haters were going to hate. He knew as soon as word got back to Jerusalem that he had been converted, that that was it. His nice, cushy seat at the council and anywhere else that he was accepted, the fancy restaurants, the, you know, all those places. Paul, you're no longer, you, you're persona non grata, dude. We don't want your money. We don't want you here. We don't even want to see you. You converted. How could you do that? Paul in Acts chapter 16, he's praising and worshiping with Silas at midnight in the prison. They had just been beaten severely and unjustly, I might add, and tossed into the clink. And they start doing their thing. People were not, the Jews were not happy that he had gone there, and they wanted to make sure that he was taken care of. They gave him a real nice send-off and some really nice lodging. And so they're in prison, and we know the story. The earth shook, the doors fly open, and they're free. The, we know that, you know, he baptized the, the jailer and his family. could have 
said, you know, I've really had enough. I'm tired of getting beaten. I'm tired of getting stoned. I'm tired of getting spit on. I'm tired. You know, I understand haters are going to hate, but these guys have taken it and ratcheted it up to a whole new level with me. They realized that Paul was a Roman citizen. That was a problem. That's a big oops. In Acts chapter 13, verse 37 out of the ERV, Paul kind of pokes him in the eye, and I kind of like it. Those officials did not prove that we did anything wrong. But they beat us in public and put us in jail. And we are Roman citizens. Uh oh. Now they want us to go away quietly. No. They must come here themselves and lead us out. I just find the irony in that so funny. I hadn't really caught the irony of it before. It just kind of caught me this time. He's poking him in the eye. You want to throw me in jail? You want to beat us, you know, to a bloody pulp? Okay. You want to play that game? All right, we'll play this game. Haters want to hate? All right, Mr. Official, because I'm a Roman citizen and you did this wrong, you come and get me out of here. I'm not leaving. Uh, nope, not going. You got to go, uh-uh, nope, 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 nope. You may hate me, but I am a child of the king. And in this instance, I'm a Roman citizen, and you're not going to treat me that way. And in the other instance, yes, I am a child of the king. And no, you are not going to treat me that way. I will not stand for it. You want me to come out? You come and get me out of here. As a child of the king, I have rights and privileges. You want me out? Come and get me. You want me to shut up? Shut me up. You want me to stop? Try to stop me. But I'm going to continue to preach and teach Jesus Christ to this lost and dying world. You want me out? You're going to have to take me out. I'm a citizen of the Most High God. I'm an ambassador for Christ. And you just tried to put restraining order on me, but it doesn't work. And I'm not going quietly. Haters are going to hate. It's amazing how the haters reacted when righteousness sprung forth. It's no different. You go to school and you want to do a Bible study at school. Haters are going to hate. You try to talk to somebody about Jesus in the store or at work or wherever. Can't you take that to the church house? Why do you got to talk to them right here about this right now, huh? Why? Why do you got to do this? Oh, I've had that happen to me. Why don't you guys go talk somewhere else? Why? I don't have to. Until there's a sign out there on that door, like the conceal carry sign that says, I can't bring it in there, until it says, no, Jesus. But even then, you know what? I'm still going to talk about Jesus Christ. I don't care if you put up a sign, you'll put up a bulletin board. I'm still going to do it. Why? Because that's what I've been entrusted to do. It changed my life, and I want to see your life change. I want to see your life transform. You can hate on me all you want to, but you know what? Me and, me and Fred over here, we got a conversation to have. Whether you realize it, Brother Paulus, there were some people looking at us a little bit while we were praying in the middle of the warehouse for my manager. I don't care. I don't care. If Brother Paulus was in there, I still would have done the same thing. Because God just moved on me. I'm like, Brian, can you wait a minute? Can we have prayer with you real quick? I don't care. 
God moved on me with another young man at work, and it was just like, I said, I typically don't do this, but, but, and I just talked to him for a couple minutes. I said, okay, I'm done. I'm going back about mine. You go back about yours. Within my own department, I can take up as much time with them as I want, so it doesn't, <laughs> I'm not going to get mad at them for, for that, but I try to keep it, keep it short, and it was, two minutes. But you know what? I know that people were listening, and they're thinking, oh, man, my boss is going to start preaching to me, <laughs> and I'm going to have to listen to it. Next, he's going to say, I need to go to church or it's going to cost me my job. No, it's not. And no, I wouldn't use my position in that manner. That would not be appropriate. But I'll still talk to him about Jesus. But you know what? Haters are going to hate. They don't have a desire to know Jesus because they don't understand who Jesus really is. Haters are going to hate. I came to a really big revelation, and I'm getting ready to close here. That where I work, which there's you sitting out here, that even though I've been looking for opportunities to get out, I haven't had a single offer. I had one, I take that back, and it was to go, it was. Two, some head under twice within three weeks sent me an email saying, hey, you want to move to Ohio? No. Now, I have no desire to move or let alone move to Ohio. But that's been about it. And it dawned on me that where I work, God's got some people there for me. I may not have come in contact with the right one yet, but I'm going to keep praying with somebody, keep talking about it till that right one is there, that one that's hungry and wants to know God. I don't care about the haters. They can do all they want. They can do all they want. They, if they don't want to hear, they can say, just please be quiet. Okay, I'll be quiet. It's on you. And being in the automotive industry, that's a hugely, severely high-pressure job. And you wouldn't believe the amount of spirits that are flying around that place. It's a lot. I got an amen over there because I know her husband works in the same place I do. It, 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 it is very, very difficult and very, very challenging in that environment. Everything is a body part. We got to get it out. It's a body part. No, it's not. It's for a car that's going to sit on a lot in some place in Mexico for the next five months. But it doesn't matter. We've got to do it, and it's got to go. But that's my mission field. That came to me. Despite all the trials and the tribulations that I have been going through. If I hadn't been there today, who would have prayed with Brian? I had been praying just earlier in the morning. God, open up a door. (laughs) <laughs> whatever that door is I, I'm not responsible for it I'm just going to try to walk through it and I know that people were looking at us and I know that people were hearing us and I know that people didn't like what we had to say while we were praying or while I was talking to that young man he may not have liked it either I don't know But haters are going to hate. Any time that we try to grow, even one little rung on the ladder, 
we are going to face opposition to that growth. And we need to hold on with everything we have to the sides of those ladders with every step we take. Because haters are going to hate and they will try to drag you and I down. They don't want us to grow closer to Jesus Christ because the closer we grow to him, the more we become like him. And the adversary doesn't like somebody resembling Jesus walking around their workplace or walking around their schools or walking around their neighborhoods. It spells a lot of trouble. They lose a lot of capital when that happens because miracles, signs, and wonders begin to follow those people who are delving so deeply into Jesus Christ that people are being translated from one kingdom to another, and he doesn't like that. So as we close... The adversary hates because he's lost any and all opportunity to be in his presence. That is the ultimate reason. He has no opportunity whatsoever to be in the presence of God for eternity. And he does not like the fact that we have that opportunity, and we have the opportunity to reach somebody else to bring them along with us. Victor, to what you said, I don't want to go to heaven alone. I want to bring some people with me. I don't want a handful of sheaves. I want to be able to get an arm around those sheaves. Say, oh, here you go, Jesus. But I could let things hinder me. I could let things stop me. But I'm not going to. His kingdom is decimated one person at a time by the power of the Holy Ghost. Every time the scales come off somebody's eyes. One more person is healed. One more person has been delivered. If Jesus is blessing and prospering and delivering and using our, our witness together, rejoice and worship him for his mighty powers and his blessings. The word of God talks about in John that if the world hates you, it's not because they hate you. It's because they hated me first. You're just walking after me. And because you're trying to be like me, they are going to hate you for what you are trying to do and accomplish for the kingdom of God. Don't marvel that they hate you. Think it not strange that that fiery trial has come upon you. Because haters are going to hate. I don't know about you. But I want to know him. And with that comes not only the, the majestic things, but the word also says that we may know him in his pain and his suffering as well. You're not going to have one without the other. And I believe that somebody's been dealing with these things for a while. And it could be maybe you've been a little jealous of seeing other people prosper. I don't know. I know I've had that happen to me before. I understand. I've been there. But God just kind of Talk to me on the side of the head and say, look, dummy. Why don't you desire to go as far as they do or farther? Duh. Sorry, Jesus. I'm wondering if there's somebody that is wanting to know him and not just know about him. And the power 
of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. Let's stand. know you more I know it's going to cost me something Jesus it always does but oh Lord I don't care about people that are trying to hold me back I want you I want to be transformed into your image Jesus I want to be touched with the power of the most high Lord, if I've had any of that envying in me, any of that jealousy, Lord, take it out of me. Get it out of me. I don't want it. I want to go forward. I want to go higher. I want to be able to rejoice with my brothers and sisters as I see you blessing them and doing wonderful things in them and through them. Let's just cry out to him. Let's talk to him. Transform us through his power. In Jesus' name.